Good afternoon. My name is Michael Sorrell. I am the president of Paul Quinn College, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this discussion on K-12 and higher ed partnerships. I'm going to uh, invite both of my co-panelists here to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their institutions um, and what they do. But let me just say this, the most critical part about any partnership is that people are doing things that you want to be a part of. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, both with KIPP and with DISD, they are doing incredible things that Paul Quinn College is excited to be a part of. So first up, Tony, why don't you introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about you and what you're doing there at KIPP. Well, thank you. Uh, Tony Smith, Regional Superintendent of KIPP Texas, Dallas-Fort Worth. Going into my third school year uh, as the superintendent in Dallas and, and just excited for the growth that we are establishing in Southern Dallas and the work that we're doing. Uh, this year, we're going to have our first graduating class of uh, KIPP Oak Cliff Academy, and that really is a culmination of 17 years of growing out KIPP, uh, Kip Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth. And as a part of a, a larger system, we have schools all over. We have merged with uh, uh, KIPP Texas San Antonio and KIPP Texas Houston and KIPP, Kip Texas Austin. I like to say that we're probably the at least the best looking group of people. It, it, <laughs> Uh, in, in, in Texas, but just really excited about the schools, how we're growing in the partnership of Paul Quinn College, particularly the, the work that this will allow us to grow in our, in our KTC, our KIPP through college world, uh, making sure that our students have a multitude of options uh, for their post-secondary success, and Paul Quinn College is a great partner. Now, the gentleman I'm going to introduce next is really a legend in the K-12 space. Um, Dr. Michael Hinojosa has been superintendent of schools for close to 200 years. Um, it, it is extraordinary the work that he has done. Um, and, and it's really, you know, the partnership that we're going to talk about today is a partnership where we have the KIPP schools, which ultimately would be pre-K through 12 on our campus. And then at DISD, it's a 6 through 12 International Baccalaureate Academy. Um, and this is really possible because of the visionary leadership of Dr. Hinojosa. So, Dr. Hinojosa, I, we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Michael. And you're so kind. appreciate the introduction. Um, and actually... Um, um, I'm, I'm very proud to be an immigrant, and I'm very proud to have grown up in Oak Cliff, the part of Dallas where I'm, I'm now leading. Um, and I had to go well, somewhere else to learn how to be an administrator. I couldn't even get an interview for an assistant principal in Dallas, but, you know, fate brought me back. This is my 27th year as superintendent, and after taking on the governor, I think I have 27 days left in my tenure. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so I think they're coming after me with the Attorney General and everybody else. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, just watch CNN and you'll figure out what's up. Um, and when my wife married me 30 years ago, I used to be handsome, but at least I still got hair, so I got these guys beat. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is one sliver of some of the transformation activities that we have going on in Dallas. And it's part of college career ready, but it's also part of public school choice. And so when I come back and describe it, but let me also tell you, Dallas is a tale of two cities. Um, if you've ever been to Dallas, you see all the beautiful buildings and we brag that we have the most Fortune 500 per capita uh, companies that are in Dallas, yet, our student population is 150,000 students, 95% economically disadvantaged, 5% white, 72% Latino, 22% uh, African American, 47% English learner. We have more English learners than El Paso ISD has students, than San Antonio has students, then Frisco has students, then San Francisco has students. We have that many English learners, and we never apologize for our demography. We're proud of our kids, and we're proud of what they're pulling off. So that's my introductory, and we'll come, we start coming back talking about the specific things here in just a moment. I'll elaborate, but it is part of that strategic initiative of 
public school choice, and I'll, I'll come back in just a moment to describe our specific partnership. So let me tell you a little bit about how we got to this place. Um, at Paul Quinn, we are a historically black college. We are, uh, in April, we will be celebrating our 150th year of continuous operation. Uh, but 15 years ago, we were a failing institution. Um, we were literally on the precipice of closing. And when I became president, um, the goal was not just to save an institution, but to transform it. And to transform it by imagining something different. And one of the things that we always dreamed about was creating a pre-K all the way up through graduate school pipeline on the campus. Now, again, when, what I said at the beginning about one of the key functions of partnerships is that you have people who are doing things that you're interested in. Well, 15 years ago, we weren't, right? I mean, we, we weren't. We became friends with the folks at KIPP when they opened up a campus in Dallas, and we were always friends with DISD, but we weren't capable of being a great partner back then, right? And so we just methodically kept working. We created the first urban work college in America. So all of our students get jobs when they come to school. And it allows us to also get them to graduate with less than $10,000 of debt. And 85% of our students the past couple of years have graduated with full-time jobs at graduation. All right. So we pushed that forward. But when the pandemic hit, we took a very different approach to managing the pandemic we decided that we were going to shut the campus down. We were one of the first schools in the country to send our students home. But then when we did so, we asked ourselves a different question. We said, what could we become if we just kept students off campus until there was a vaccine and until there was reliable testing? What could we possibly accomplish? And we made a list of things that we wanted to address and fix. And some of them we were going to need to get lucky about, right? Like we, we built two new buildings. We cleared out part of the campus and created a walking trail. We added three new majors. We added a graduate program. We redid all the roads on the campus. Um, we turned over entire underperforming sections in our college. Uh, but in the back of our mind, we, we had this dream, like what if we could add a school to the campus? And we got lucky. Right? Like, I wish I could tell you that it was part of a master plan when we went into the pandemic that we would be able to attract KIPP and be able to attract DISD, but I would be lying to you, right? We got lucky. KIPP approached us and wanted to talk about a partnership, um, which, you know, I think that was probably like the easiest conversation, you know, like, what do you think? Yes. Right? <laughs> it was a very, very easy yes. And, you know, we... We were excited about that, right? And, you know, Tony, why don't you talk a little bit about KIPP and how you all were growing and what necessitated the need for looking at a, a slightly different way of holding classes? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, you know, KIPP started in 2003 in Dallas in uh, Lancaster Keys, which is a part of southern Dallas that is in desperate need of, of support. Uh, for students, high poverty, high students, high, high population students of color, English language learners, and it's seemingly uh, sort of neglected by the city. And so we've had a school there for 17 years, uh, and we decided that this wasn't the environment any longer that we wanted to grow and to, to root ourselves in Dallas in. And so when looking at different opportunities, we came across Paul Quinn College uh, and really loved what they were doing. Dr. Sherrill always talks a little bit about uh, nation building and how do we support kids of color of, uh, in, in being the change that they want to see in the world but also seeing that change happening in front of them with people that look like them. And that was really important to us as we started to investigate potential partnerships and where do we want to grow and, 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 and plant these roots in Dallas. Uh, and, and so when we approached Paul Quinn College, uh, the first thing that stood out to us was uh, we over me. And that's one of the things that we preach heavily at KIPP, which is team and family. How do we support one another in getting to the place where we can be successful together? And as I got to know Paul Quinn College, got to know President Sorrell, got to know the, the, the community, what was really exciting to me about this partnership is that this is an opportunity for kids to see that 
you look just like me and you're having success. The pride that comes out of Paul Quinn College from the alumni that have come back, from the people that talk about it is so exciting. And to bring that to a K through 12 educational setting so people see like, I want to go to Paul Quinn College. I want to be there. I'm so excited. There's no other option for me but to graduate high school and jump into Paul Quinn College or college in general is such an exciting opportunity for kids. Um, and it's a community building opportunity for students. Partnering with DISD and, and learning from them and what they do and, and being that, that choice field center uh, is a great opportunity for all. I, I applaud Dr. Hinojosa because he said before, you know, charters have made us step up our game. Well, now we're at the place where we're all stepping up our game. This pandemic has really highlighted a lot of deficiencies in education and made us change and be innovative. And so this is a great opportunity for us to come out of the pandemic better than what we went in and with a clear vision for what that's going to be for our students and our staff. So I'm extremely excited about this. And so part of what you're hearing is a growth mindset, is an openness to becoming better and being transparent. And, you know, one of the things that has been fascinating, you'll sometimes run into people who look at charter schools and look at public schools and think that they can be only one relationship, and that is that of being adversarial. And that doesn't have to be. That is a scarcity mindset, right? Like, at our best, all of us should inspire each of us to be better institutions for the students and the communities we serve. I mean, it may be just a very, very small way, but do you know that we never had street signs on our campus? Right, like never had, no, some of that is because it's not a huge campus. We have 140 acres, but most of it is undeveloped. But we can't have families coming to campus and there'd be no street signs. So now we have street signs, right? It may seem like a small thing, but all of these things are ways to work together to be better for the people who depend on us. And I will tell you, initially when Kip and our, when the partnership between Paul, Kenny and Kip, Paul Quinn and Kip came up, there were some individuals that were against it. But what I thought was really interesting was that Dr. Hinojosa always understood the opportunity. And so Dr. Hinojosa, I thought it might be interesting for you to talk about the Haynes Prep, but also just talk about what allowed you to see this differently. And because frankly, we would have never gotten here without your support. Thank you, Dr. Rails. And part of it was we, we all got lucky. But part of it is having the abundance mentality rather than the deficit mentality. And so I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you that when I was superintendent in Dallas in 2009, because I was there from 05 to 11, and then I went to Georgia, Cobb County, Georgia, and then I retired for a year. Then I came back to Dallas, and I've been there since uh, 2015. So when I was superintendent in Ahosa 1.0, I'm embarrassed to tell you that in 2009, only 7% of our students got any kind of post-secondary credential six years after graduating from high school. When I first was in Dallas, we did blocking and tackling, getting rid of the scandals, putting the curriculum in, and it was just basic trying to get urban education to work. So then I'm, I'm very proud to tell you that today, Despite the pandemic, this year, and Taylor Shedd's in the audience, she helped us do this. This year, 10% of our students are graduating from high school with an associate's degree for free before the, before the six-year clock starts. And once they get an associate's degree, they can taste a bachelor's degree, and now they're even thinking about a professional degree. And let me tell you the, the, the best stat that I found. When we were doing that, we found that 56% of these students who graduated with an associate's degree for free at the age of 18 failed one portion of the state eighth grade exam. So we weren't cherry picking kids. These were kids we needed to get them motivated. So, and that was our journey with Dallas College. And if you, I'm going to be going to another panel where we're talking about green light, our blockchain technology um, that they've helped us pioneer and Dr. May Tremendous partner. So we had a great partnership with community college. UNT Dallas was helping us then get those kids from, bachelor's, from associate's degree to bachelor's degree. And by the way, we also had to pivot. We were just getting an associate's degree in applied sciences, but we, our kids wanted to go to four-year institutions, so we had to pivot on that. So then 
separately. SMU and Toyota are helping us build a K-8 STEM school in West Dallas. That's, already, that's, that's under construction right now. We have our first group of students this year. UT Southwestern, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center is helping. We're building a K-8 STEM campus on their facility, one of the biggest facilities in, in the world for medicine. We already talked about Dallas College. Texas A&M Commerce is helping us design a school of the future, a K-12 school, along with the North Dallas Chamber in the rich part of North Dallas. But what's missing? We don't have an HBCU. So when this guy rocks my world by bringing him a school, I learned from one of these rappers, don't get bitter, get better. <laughs> so what I did, and my, one of my board members was yelling at me because I wanted to talk to him. Another board member was yelling at me, you better talk to him because he's my friend. <laughs> so I can't win for losing. So then we broached the idea and we have a whole office of transformation and innovation. And our people in that office are trained in design thinking, and they were trained at Stanford University. So they help us. So if, if you're a principal, if you're a college, if you're a teacher, if you're a community member, and you want to start up a school in Dallas, they will help you design the application, and we'll walk you through that whole application. And so at first, we had some ideas about Paul Quinn. They're a liberal arts university. So what would be a great match in Southern Dallas when we all came to the epiphany and the design team came up with, you know, uh, International Baccalaureate, it was a perfect alignment. It meets their mission. It gets rigor in Southern. We had IB schools in other parts of Dallas, but we did not have one in Southern Dallas. And so we, we're starting that school next week. And he gave us his library and we're reconstructing it. We put a bunch of dollars in there. And now we went out and recruited kids all over Southern Dallas, not just Southern Dallas, Southern Dallas County. And we'll transport the kids. We'll get them there. We're starting small with, fit, with middle school, and then we're going to build it out. This is a long-term project. So when they graduate, they have an automatic affinity for this great university that's on their campus. And we're going to help them grow them, but we're helping our kids grow. So this was just a partnership that became a win-win, and now those students that are underserved are gonna have this great opportunity. And with, you know, most of our kids qualify for some kind of grant, you know? And so Dallas County Promise is another initiative that we have, that if you wanna to go to college, not having money is not gonna be the problem. Community college and others have found a way to have the last dollar and that they'll pay for last dollar, whatever your Pell Grants don't get you there. So that's how, from my perspective, it was kind of an accident because we got pushed a little bit. We were mad because he was going to go in there. <laughs> so we had to figure out, you know, nobody wants a whiner. That's they right. want a problem solver. Yeah, that's right. So we took this problem and solved it as a win-win. And let me say, some of the cool things that you can do so one of the reasons why the International Baccalaureate Academy made sense is because at our school, we have a requirement that to graduate from Paul Quinn, every student must study abroad at some point in their education. This is so important for a school where 85% of their students are Pell Grant eligible because those students have been coached their whole lives that things are outside their reach. And imagine what happens when they begin to see themselves as a global citizen. And one of the ways in which we encourage this and encourage outside the box thinking is because we are in the Southwest and there are lots of Native American tribes, those tribes are sovereign nations. So our students can go study amongst the tribes and meet that requirement. So it allows them to see different cultures with, you know, if they want to go to Europe, we're fine with that. If they want to go to Africa, we're fine with that. But if for some reason they need to go to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, we are fine with that as well. And these types of ways, the International Baccalaureate Academy is teaching Italian. 
so we're not teaching Italian. Well, we weren't teaching Italian, right? <laughs> we're going to start borrowing their teachers for Italian. I mean, there's just all these possibilities. We also, the three entities, are partnering to reconfigure our soccer field. And so we're adding lights, we're adding artificial turf, we're going to mark it out so that there can also be lacrosse. And apparently, I don't know if you guys know, but I found out last week, we're talking about adding a track, right? Like, I mean, so it's, it's exciting what can happen if you just embrace what Dr. Hennels said about an abundance mentality, right? Now we are three institutions in the southern part of Dallas that are going to do extraordinary things for students who are going to be challenged through rigor, through opening up their minds to aspire for lives that they would never, ever have possibly thought about. And let me build on that, Michael, because a lot of times things fall apart because you have an episodic leader. And you always wonder, you know, Michael's been there for a long time, and what would happen if he left? Gerald Turner's been the president of SMU for decades, if you've never been on that campus, oh my God, every building is phenomenal because he's been there for the long haul. And so many people are in, in it for instant gratification. What's in it for me and what, what accolades am I gonna get? The people that don't play the long game can never get the results. That's why you have all this strife in urban America because the leaders don't get to stay around. Some of it is self-inflicted. Some of it is when you poke the governor in the eye. But I've already But been sometimes there. the governor needs to be poked in the okay, eye. Okay, well, that's... All right. <laughs> let's, let's. But, but regardless, is you got to figure out how to make sure... Because, you know, as, as presidents and superintendents, we're part of the problem because we want our ego on this thing. And we, well, the last guy did that. I'm going to throw it out, you know. And, and so that's kind of... We have to develop things that will allow this to perpetuate long after we're gone. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add on that. I think sitting where I'm at in the middle of two great leaders, right, the, the, the idea of both of them have invested a lot of time and effort into their respective organizations and started to see them flourish. Uh, and I'm excited to learn and to grow and to, to, to hear where the potholes are, but then also this idea of innovation and this idea of growing together and this idea of providing community resources is one that isn't talked about a lot in Southern Dallas. And so this is an opportunity for us to green light community change, right? I, I'm so excited that this combats that idea of the single narrative, which is you can only be successful this way. Well, what you have is three different options and we'll innovate and grow and get better. So you might have five, six, seven, eight options at the end of the day, that provides a community with choice. And that's key, choice and agency in your own education to be successful, to go out and seize the opportunities. And so I'm just thankful to sit here and learn. I'm, I think I'm gonna join you guys out there and <laughs> just learn and, and, and pick up knowledge. What, Doc, did you have something you wanted to say? I was gonna say, so sometimes we underestimate the potential from an HBCU because we get infatuated with other organizations. Let me tell you, the, the lady who is now my chief of school leadership, when, when she was growing up in L.A., she was homeless. But somehow, Paul Quinn College got her to come out, leave L.A., go to Southern Dallas, and then her career has just skyrocketed. She's now my like number three or four in the whole district, African American female, and she's a rock star. And but now she's seen everything. But see, when when you see the art of the possible, and then you build the structures around it to make it happen, and we always have these people with a silver bullet. You know, you know, mayors get elected for four years, and it's hard to see beyond those four years. But I've told the last four Dallas mayors, if you want to grow Southern Dallas, it's going to take a long time. And it's how you do it organically. You give these skills sets to these kids. When kids are coming out with associate's degree and bachelor's degree and professional degrees, they are going to have disposable income. And once they have disposable income, then they're going to want to buy property in the hood where they grow up. And once they buy property in the hood, they're going to demand a Starbucks. 
And then they're going to demand a grocery Barnes store. And, Noble. and they're going to demand medicine being in their hood. But it, it's not going to happen overnight. But if you don't start now with these partnerships, how are you going to get there? I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that was, listen, that was preach, right? <laughs> like, all right, well, one of the things we wanted to do um, was give people an opportunity to ask questions. And I know that can sort of be taboo um, in this, this setup, but are there any questions that folks would like to see us answer? If not, we have lots of more material that we can go through. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and we have a microphone here because you're going to be recorded and Hi, I'm Preeti Shrikhande, and I'm the founder of Eventsity, um, a program for middle and high school students for social emotional learning. So my main, I think a lot of things that hold us back are these social emotional skills as well. And so how have you worked with that? What do you see, you know, what can be done to help the students overcome? I mean, it happens across the world. Anyone at any level needs social emotional skills. It's not like just because it's a millionaire, they don't, but I'm just understanding, but to get past that, uh, especially at that level, like you said, you know, the 85% think that they, they have boundaries around them. Um, so what are the key things that you feel would help um, and how can we help that community? Sure. Why don't we start with Doc and then we'll come down this way. Yeah, I got a lot to say about that. We were very fortunate that we got a $7 million grant from the Wallace Foundation to expand social emotional learning district wide. And we copied the playbook from Austin and Cleveland and we were having good success. We trained the adults first, and then we were going to train the kids. But then, because we were with Wallace, Rand wanted to have a research study. So we had to have a treatment group and a control group. Okay. We're about research instead of kids. So then the pandemic hit. Guess what? We threw the research out because we spread the good stuff to everybody. We started with the adults first because if the adults don't get it, the kids aren't going to get it. And so then, during the pandemic, I asked a rhetorical question to my staff. I asked, why would I ever suspend a student again? I said, first we got these devices, we got this technology, we've got this de professional development, we got all of this stuff, why? And then, we only have 10% of our student population is African American males. 51% of our suspensions are African-American males. So we're contributing to this problem, and it's related to social-emotional learning, rest restorative justices, practices. So my staff, I thought they were going to bring me back a plan that if a kid gets in trouble, we're going to put them over here so that we don't have to send them home to break into somebody's house. Well, they came back with something much better, and we're going to be... Uh, test case this year. We're starting this this year. So what we're doing, not only are they re-engineering out of school suspension, they're re-engineering in school suspension. Now if you get in a big hairy fight or you're dealing drugs, you have to be expelled. I mean, you, you don't have a choice. But we found out that 75% of our suspensions were discretionary because we were telling a kid to read and he couldn't read, he'd get mad and throw a chair and it was his fault. So what we're going to do, we're going to start reset centers. And we have, you know, in Texas, there's two sports, football and spring football. And so, so if you're not a very good teacher, but you're the offensive coordinator, you go to in-school suspension because you're a big coach and everybody's quiet and afraid of you. That's not changing behavior. So now these reset centers, we're using SEL strategies. We're painting the, we, we have kidney furniture. We have couches. We, they have to go get training. And the principal didn't get to hire the offensive coordinator to be we have behavior specialists. So we're blowing it all up. And luck luckily, we're in with a group. McKenzie's going to do lend us um, some consultants to help us figure out where we're going to make our mistakes. But here's an opportunity to redirect some things that we haven't done well and to help these students who get in triage. Now, because now we can have asynchronous learning, 
You know, first we got to get their mind right. But now they have the best lessons from the best teachers because we have them all recorded. And now they can go back and get some instruction while they learn how to redirect their behavior. So wishes, we've been doing SEL for a long time, but now we're taking it to a new level with this new opportunity. And, and you know, never waste a good crisis. And then you're getting this opportunity, you got to find a way to reinvent what you're doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I, I would agree. Dr. Enos is, is speaking the truth around how do you re, reconfigure the way kids interact with school. And we always talk about whole child and what the children need to be successful. And at KIPP, we really built our foundation on that, that relationship. How do we foster strong relationships with parents and communities, but also kids to make sure they want to be there? And so how do we take this and really make a belonging space? And so wrapping up our SEL and not only our teacher development, because like, I, like Dr. Enhosa said, it, it, if the teacher doesn't get it, the kid's not going to get it. And so using that opportunity to really invest in our teachers, showing them how to do it, working with them and developing their skill sets, and then creating belonging and brave spaces for kids, as we deal with their families, as we deal with their family situations, as we deal with their uh, learning deficits, as we support them in engaging in the educational process. Too many times through this pandemic, we talked about unfinished learning or learning loss. And many people say, well, what are you going to do about that? And a lot of the solutions that are coming up are punishments, right? We got to send them to school longer. We got to do this. We got to do that. Now, there is an element of more. You got to do more to get more. But also, we want to capture that element of I want to be here because this is a great place for me. I feel safe. I feel comfortable. I feel like I can thrive. And similar to what Dr. Hinojosa was saying, how do we get people to just be so invested in their school that we revert back to that community hub, right? This is a place where we're going to learn, be safe, be free, can be myself because teachers understand who I am and how to, how to support me and be in my best selves. And you will have outliers. You will have kids that need to be suspended. But it's also how do you reintroduce a kid into an environment? And we're coming off 18 months of kids not being in schools. So how you reintroduce students into an academically rigorous, high expectation learning environment? Well, with love and with uh, relationship and with open arms. It's not about what they can't do. It's about, I'm so happy to see you. You're here. Let's start to create together. And so I agree 100% with Dr. Hinojosa said and think that we build that relationship key at KIPP. And I want to I wanna see it just, just explode. So we sort of learned it the hard way. Um, when I became president of Paul Quinn, like I said, we were a failing institution. Um, I think we had a 33% retention rate. Um, the students were angry. Uh, they were disappointed. The community was disappointed. I mean, when you hold out hope and then you fail to deliver upon that hope, people who, and hope is a precious commodity. So people who feel betrayed treat you as such. So my first summer, um, you know, it's, it's tough, right? I've been president for two months. Uh, we have 30 days of cash on hand. We're, you know, we're in trouble. And I'm frustrated. I used to go home every night. Um, I'd walk past the picture. We'd have 33 pres 34 presidents. I'm the 34th president. And... I passed by all their pictures on the wall on the way home, and it was as if they were judging me, right? They're, they're looking at me, they're like, we kept the school open during, you know, Reconstruction. We kept the school open during the Great Depression. We kept the school open during Jim Crow. You're going to kill our school, right? And so I it was stressful. And one day I'm getting to an argument with one of my male students on campus, and he's yelling at me, and, you know, look, it was... 15 years ago, well, it was 14 years ago, I well, wasn't quite 40. And, you know, I wasn't always this calm demeanor that you see right now. Um, so I probably responded in a way that was not very presidential, right? So we're yelling at each other, screaming, cussing each other out on the way up the stairs. He gets into my office and he breaks down in tears. And now I grew up in Chicago, you know, wonderful family, but, you know, Chicago's a tough city. So I'm looking at him like, Pfft. How are you going to cry, right? Like I, I did not have the ability to be who I needed to be for him. Thankfully, I had one of my older staff members in the room. She comforted him. She escorted him out. And then she came back and turned her complete disgust on me. And, and she looks at me and she says, you know, I met your mother. 
And you know, I was like, are you going to the mama car now, <laughs> right? And she said, and your mother was tough on you. She said, but your mother loved you. She said, you have never spent one second of your life wondering if you were loved. She's like, truthfully, you show all the markings of someone who's been overloved. And I was like, I think you just said something mean about me, right? Um, and she said, let me ask you something. If you've never known love, would you hear anything other than tough in your voice? She said, I know you love us, and I know you want this school to succeed. She said, but you are hard on us. She's like, if you want us to trust you, if you want us to follow you, you're going to have to learn to lead with love. The single greatest leadership lesson and piece of advice I have ever been given in my life was her learn to lead with love. Here's what that translated into. We changed everything. We started having conversations with our students and understanding their issues more. Why are you angry? What is disappointing to you? What, tell us, what are the stress points in your life? Students said, well, we, we can't afford school. Okay, well, what if we cut the cost of tuition and fees? So we cut it by $10,000. Students said, well, we're never competitive for jobs. All right, well then let's become a work college to give you a competitive advantage and we'll go out and get internships and we'll spend four years teaching you all of this stuff. And every single thing, we just kept asking, what can we do better? How can we help you? We realized that so many of our students had been abused. So we started a mental health program with UT Southwestern where they brought in their, their residents and now, if you're an incoming student at Paul Quinn, you get a mental health evaluation. We have normalized it, right? So now everyone gets their needs met, and we listen. When we had the pandemic, we sent home laptops and Wi-Fi, and we sent it to everyone. So what we don't do is single out people so that they feel as if their experience makes them somehow less than. We just, everyone starts at the same place, and if you don't need it, cool. But you have it anyway. And so we've tried through listening to our students and, and just being better for them to, to do that. And, and the last piece that we do is we've changed our instructional model. So we believe in challenge-based learning. So we incorporate the students' lives into our lesson planning. And our question is very, very fundamental. What are the issues that you care most about in your life? Right? So I'm one of the professors. I start each semester, tell me what you care about the most. And the students tell me, and then I go back and I design the classroom experience to incorporate the things that they care about the most, and then we teach them to solve the problems of their lives. That's how we've tried to approach it. Next question. Oh, we were that, we were that bad? Uh, all right, well, I, I will tell you what, I'm going to uh, we have two minutes left, so gentlemen, why don't you give us some concluding remarks? You know, I, I, can, I can only say I'm, how excited I am, but I think the thing that's a consistent through line that you're hearing from Dr. Hinojosa and President Sorrell is commitment and investment, that nothing worth having is going to happen overnight. And this isn't an episode. This is uh, three entities coming together, committed to making a change in the communities in which we serve and for the students of Southern Dallas. And so I'm excited, I'm committed, and you know, this partnership may look different, and hopefully it does five years down the road because we've adjusted. And so uh, with that through line, I think we're gonna be extremely successful, and I'm excited to see what the future holds. Dr. Ellis? I'll briefly talk about the past, the present, and the future. The past, be proud of who you are and where you come from. I'm proud to be an immigrant. I'm proud to be from Oak Cliff, part of Dallas. Uh, and I'm proud because you are a set of your experiences. And so never forget that that's who you are. You got to do you, but it's not about you. Second, in the present, always be enthusiastic. Be present. Nothing great is ever accomplished in the absence of enthusiasm. And the third Look to the future with hope and aspiration because us working together, we're going to solve this tale of two cities in Dallas. Stay tuned. You just may be as old as I am before we do it. Well, the, the last thing that I would say to you 
is last two things of this. Number one, please keep in mind that we are just warming up. Right? Like this is this is day one. Wait until you see what we do when we actually know what we're doing. All right. And number two is just this. Thank you. Thank you for caring enough to show up to learn about what we're doing. Thank you enough to engage in the lives of students. And thank you for being present in this period of time as we all work to create a better country through the service to our students. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.